Hello, my dear children. Today also, I have come to meet you with an interesting science lesson. At the end of our grade 6 science syllabus, I thought of doing a revision lesson with you to recall or revise what you have learned in your past lessons. I am sure this revision lesson will be very important for you to brush up your knowledge. You can recall or you can revise what you have learned in your past units. In this revision lesson, I have selected some several parts of our grade 6 science syllabus. There are 11 questions. These questions are based on all the units. We will see one by one before that. Let's see what you have learnt in your grade 6 science syllabus. What did you learn in grade 6 science syllabus? In the first unit, the wonders of the living world. We were talking about the characteristics of organisms and the differences between plants and animals. My dear children, I think you all can remember the organisms in our environment can be divided into three main groups. The plants, the animals and the microorganisms. We discussed about the characteristics of plants and characteristics of animals. There are microorganisms are also available in our environment, but we can't see them. The microorganisms cannot be observed through our naked eye. Especially, we emphasize about plants and animals in this unit. And the differences between plants and animals. What are the differences between plants and animals? What are the characteristics of plants and what are the characteristics of animals? The second unit was the things around us, matter and energy, states of matter, specific properties of solid matter. I think you all can remember in this unit we were talking about matter and energy. How did we define matter? Can you remember? Yes, I think. We defined matter as the things that occupy a space and with the mass. The things without mass and do not occupy a space are called as energies. Energies do not occupy a space and they do not have a mass. I think you can understand the difference between matter and energy. Then a specific properties of solid matter. The solids have special properties. They have got specific properties. These properties are used in our day to day needs. We were talking about special properties of solids as well. In our third unit, we were talking about water. You know, water is a natural resource. We get number of benefits. We get number of uses from water. The topic was divided into three subtopics as states of water, importance of water and water pollution. The water is in three states. They are solid state, liquid state and gaseous state, right? Then the importance of water, how the water is important in our daily activities, in industries and to many other activities. Then water pollution, how water becomes polluted, how it becomes unsuitable for the consumption of humans. So that was discussed in water pollution and at the end of that unit we discussed how to minimize the water pollution. In unit 4, the energy in day to day life, we were talking about energy. As you can remember, there were a number of energy sources. We can obtain energy from various sources and the applications of different sources of energy. What are the applications of different sources of energy? We have already discussed all these things. In unit 5, light and vision. Light and vision, I think uh, you have done number of activities in this unit. Firstly, we discussed about sources of light, then light rays and light beams and applications of light. My dear children, you know that our main source of light is the sun. Sun is our main source of light. But in addition to sun, there are a number of sources of light. 
the sources of light can be divided into two main groups, luminous objects and non-luminous objects. The objects that can produce their own light are called as luminous objects and the objects that can't produce their own light are called as non-luminous object, right? Then light rays and light beams. Now I am sure that you can draw a light ray alone and you can draw a light beam alone. You can draw a light ray as a straight line and there should be an arrow head on the line. A light beam is a collection of light rays. A number of light rays combined together to make a light beam. I am sure that you know the difference between a light ray and light beam. Then applications of light, what are the uses of light in our day to day activities, right? In many activities the light is very important, it is a useful energy type. In unit 6, sound and hearing, sound and hearing that was a short unit. As you can remember we were talking about how to produce sounds and how we hear the sounds and music and noise. The sound can be produced by vibrating something, right? Then how we hear the sound? To hear a sound we should have a healthy ear as well as a source of sound. As well the sound should come to our ear. Music and noise, the sounds that are rhythmically played are known as music. The sounds that are not rhythmic are known as noise, right. Then in unit 7 we were talking about magnets, I think you all can remember how you used magnets, how you identified the faults of a magnet, different types of magnets, you observed different types of magnets in your school laboratory and the behavior of a magnet, how similar poles repel each other and how different poles of magnets attract each other. Then in unit 8, we learnt about electricity for a comfortable life, how electricity can be used to make our life more comfortable. Under that main topic, there were several subtopics in this way, generating electricity, preparation of circuits, conductors and insulators and electronic appliances. Generating electricity, the electricity is generated in number of methods. I think you already know those methods. Then preparation of circuits, how a circuit is prepared. Conductors and insulators, what do you mean by conductors? The conductors can transmit the electricity. So metals are considered as conductors. There are number of conductors other than metals. Then insulators, the insulators cannot transmit the electricity and electronic appliances like resistors and diodes. In unit 9 we were talking about heat and its effects, effects of heat and heat generation. Heat is a type of energy, how heat is produced. There are number of methods of producing heat, we were talking about that. Then what are the effects of heat on our environment? What is the effect of heat on the survival of organisms? Those are the things we discussed in that unit. In unit 10, we discuss about food related interactions. What are the interactions based on food? You know the plants produce food and the animals depend on the food produced by the plants directly or indirectly. Then the modes of nutrition of animals, uh, different types of food taken by the animals. Some animals are herbivorous, some animals are carnivorous and some animals are omnivorous. Then food webs, several interconnected food chains are known as a food web and food chains. We have already discussed all these things. Finally, as the last unit of our syllabus, you learnt about weather and climate. Sometimes we misunderstand that the weather and the climate are same, but they are not same, they are different. So you understood the difference between the weather and the climate. And 
climatic changes and natural disasters. What are the natural disasters uh, occurred in our surrounding? Then climatic changes and we discussed about different instruments used to measure the climatic changes, right? My dear children, now we had 11 units in our syllabus. Now in this revision lesson, these 11 units are revised, right? We will see the questions first. Question number one. This question is based on unit one, wonders of the living world. Question number one is based on unit one. Look at the question. I think you all can read the question with me. Identify the differences between plants and animals and complete the following grid. Right? I am sure that you have got your writing book in your hand. So you have to take down the question. You can draw the grid in your writing book and let us see the answers. Characteristics of plants. On your left side you have to list out the characteristics of plants and on the other side you can list out the characteristics of animals. Then you can check whether your answers are similar to my answers. Here are the answers given by me. You can see that the plants and animals are compared in the table in this way. Let us take one by one. Look at the first row. Plants grow fixed to the ground. They do not show locomotion but show movements. Animals show locomotion. Right? Once again let us read it. Plants grow fixed to the ground, they do not show locomotion but show movements. Animals show locomotion. My dear children, so what do you mean by locomotion? What do you mean by movement? Both movement and locomotion are same or not? No, locomotion is different from movement. Both plants and animals can show the movements. But locomotion is a common feature only for animals. The plants can show some movements. They can show some movements but they can't do the locomotion. Locomotion means the movement from one place to another. The animals can move from one place to another. We know that they have different appendages for that. When we think about a bird, it uses its wings to go from one place to another. When we think about animals, they use their legs or limbs to go from one place to another. So they have different appendages, they have different modes of locomotion. But when we think about the plants, the plants can't go from one place to another. They are fixed onto a surface but they can show some movements. What kind of movements? The plants can move towards the sunlight. They show movements towards the water, right? They show movements towards the gravity. Like that, the plants can show the movements, but they can't do the locomotion. That is one main difference between plants and animals. Look at the second row of the table. Produce their own food by photosynthesis. Hence, they are autotrophic. Then, when we think about the animals, they do not produce their own food, depend on other plants and animals for food. Hence, they are heterotrophic. So the main difference between the plants and animals is autotrophic and heterotrophic. The plants are autotrophic because they can produce their own food. I think you all can remember when we were learning unit 10, I explained you that the plants can use the sunlight to produce the food. So the plants are known as producers. They can produce their own food. So they are autotrophic. But when we think about the animals, the animals directly or indirectly depend on the food produced by the plants. So the animals are considered as heterotrophic. Autotrophic and heterotrophic, these two words are important. So you have to learn those two words. Look at the third row of the table. Chlorophyll is present within the cells. 
but the animals do not have chlorophyll within the cells. You know chlorophyll is a green color pigment which is available in plant cells only. Chlorophyll is not present in animal cells. If animals have got chlorophyll, they can do photosynthesis. You know that the animals can't do photosynthesis. The chlorophyll is a color pigment which is present only in plant cells. Chlorophyll is absent within the cells in animals. Look at the last one. Growth is visible during the entire lifespan. Growth is unlimited. Growth in animals visibly stops after a certain period of time. Right? Uh, children, you know that the growth of the plants is unlimited. It does not stop after a certain time. But when we think about the animals, their growth is limited. The growth of the animals stops after a certain period of time. Right. Now, by looking at this table, you can understand the differences between plants and animals, right? Then, I'm sure that you will be able to compare the plants and animals in a suitable way by looking at this table. Let's see the second question. Question number two. This is based on plant and animal classification. Uh, why do we need a classification? We need a plant and animal classification to study them easily. We need to classify the plants and animals. So the method that is suggested to classify the plants and animals is the dichotomous keys. Now we will see what a dichotomous key is. What is known as a dichotomous key? Let's see the answer. Categorization of organisms using the presence or absence of a characteristic feature is known as a dichotomous key. Right? Can you remember this definition? We have given you this definition for dichotomous keys. I think you all have learnt it and you can remember that. You can read with me. Categorization of organisms using the presence or absence of a characteristic feature is known as a dichotomous key, right? Let's take an example. Look at the question. Use a dichotomous key to classify the given animals, right? Now we are going to construct a dichotomous key. I think you will help me, right? I have given you six animals. Let's see. Here are the animals given by me. You can see sparrow, cat, rabbit, butterfly, cobra and elephant. There are six animals. Sparrow, cat, rabbit, butterfly, cobra and elephant. When we write a dichotomous key, Always we have to use an external feature that can be easily identified. We have to use an external feature that can be easily identified. But we can't use the color of the animal. We can't use the internal features of the animals. The features that are selected to construct the dichotomous keys are, should always be very clear. They should be external features. Now you can see what are the features that are selected by me. With wings and without wings. I think you can remember when I was explaining about the dichotomous keys, I said you that presence and absence of a characteristic feature, right? So when we construct the dichotomous key, we have to think about the presence and absence of the feature. With wins, without wins, right? With wins, without wins. My dear children, you have to consider the animals given here. Sparrow, cat, rabbit, butterfly, cobra and elephant. Out of the animals given there, the animals with wins are sparrow and butterfly. The sparrow and the butterfly have got wins. Then without wings, you know the other animals do not have wings. Cat, 
rabbit, cobra and elephant. Once again I will divide the first group of animals in this way. The animals with wings are divided into two with a beak and without a beak. We use that external feature, we use the feature that is beak, presence of beak and absence of beak. A sparrow has got a beak but the butterfly has not a beak, it has a proboscis to suck nectar from the flowers. So according to that we can divide sparrow and the butterfly. So you see that these two animals can't be divided more then we can stop the division from this place. Now let us see the other side. With a trunk, without a trunk, the elephant has got a trunk. The elephant with a trunk, then there are three animals without a trunk, cat, rabbit and cobra. We will see how to divide them. With legs and yes, without legs. Without a trunk, the cat, rabbit and cobra, that group of animals also can be divided into two groups according to the presence of legs and according to the absence of legs. Then with legs, there are two animals, the cat and the rabbit. The cobra does not have legs, it is a type of snake. Again, the animals with legs are divided into two groups in this way without a lawn tail. You know that the cat is an animal with the lawn tail. We can easily identify that external feature and without the lawn tail, the rabbit, it has a short tail. My dear children, so look at the dichotomous key which is constructed on the screen. By looking at the screen, you can understand the features of a dichotomous key. You can observe that we have used external features only. We do not use internal features. As well, we have used the presence and absence of characteristics. Finally, one animal is remaining. So those are the features of the dichotomous key. Now I think it is clear, we can move on to the next question now. Question number 3, this is based on unit 2, things around us. Compare solids, liquids and gases in the grid given below. Form of matter, I have given you three forms of matter, solid, liquid and gas. Then you have to think about the shape and volume of these forms of matter. We will see the answers. When we think about the solids, they have a definite shape and they have a definite volume. When we think about the solids, they have a definite shape. When you think about the solids in your surrounding, they have a definite shape. We can't easily change their shape and they have got a definite volume. But when we think about the liquids, the liquids have the shape of the container. I think you have got that experience. When you put a certain liquid to a vessel, the liquid takes the shape of the vessel. When the same amount of liquid is transferred to another vessel, it takes the shape of that vessel. So the liquids take the shape of the container, that is very important, but the liquids have got a definite volume. When we think about gases, the gases do not have a shape and they do not have a volume. The grasses spread everywhere. So they do not have a shape as well as they do not have a definite volume. Question number four, right? Fill in the blanks with suitable words. Things with the mass and occupy space are known as. Things with the mass and occupy space are known as matter. I have already given you the answer but you have to think about matter and energies. The matter occupy space as well as they have got a mass but when we think about the energies they do not occupy a space and they no, do not have a mass. The amount of matter 
in an object is referred as the mass of the object, right. My dear children, uh, we do not know the difference between mass and weight. Normally, we think that both mass and weight are same, but they are not same. There are differences. The mass is the amount of matter contained in an object, but the weight is a force. You know that all the objects are attracted towards the earth. The weight is a force. It is measured in Newton, but mass is measured in kilograms. My next question is based on the measuring unit of mass. The international unit of measuring the mass is kilograms. You know that the mass can be measured in grams, milligrams and kilograms, but the international unit of measuring mass is kilograms. Look at the fourth question. The tendency of a material to break under a small force is called brittleness. The tendency of a material to break under a small force is called brittleness. The materials like chalk, coal and sulphur have got this feature, brittleness. Diamond is a material with a high hardness. You can write the iron also, but the diamond is the best answer because it is one of the hardest materials in the world. Diamond is a material with a high hardness. Then, teeth and gloves are made of rubber because of their property of elastic nature. Teeth and gloves are made of rubber because of their property of elastic nature. Gold is used to make jewellery because of their property of malleability and ductility. My dear children, by looking at this slide, you can see some words. The words are brittleness, hardness, elastic nature, malleability and ductility. Uh, I will explain you what these features are. Brittleness is a special feature of solids. When the solids are breaking down into pieces under a very small force, we say that those solids or those materials have got brittleness. Then elastic nature. When we apply a force, the length of an object is increased and if it comes to its earlier position, we call that elastic nature. Especially rubber has got this nature. Then malleability and ductility. What do you mean by malleability? Malleability means the ability of drawing into thin sheets, right? That is known as the malleability and the ductility is some materials can be drawn into thin wires. That is known as the ductility. Now, I think you all can remember you have learned all these things. I wanted you to recall what you learned. Look at last three questions. A gas occupies the whole volume of the container and a material with soft texture is baby talc. Light is an example for energy. You see the gases occupy the whole volume of the container. We have learnt it in unit 2 and a material with soft texture. What do you mean by texture? Texture is the way we feel something that is known as the texture. A material with soft texture is baby talc, but there are certain materials with hard texture like sandpapers, right? Then a material with soft texture is baby talc. Light is an example for energy. You know, light, heat, electricity are some examples for energies. The light is an example for energy that is not a matter. Question number 5. Select the correct answer. You have to underline the correct answer. Water with high salinity is known as, there are four choices, simple A, muddy water, simple B, brackish water, simple C, fresh water, simple D, marine water. First of all, I would like to explain you what the salinity is. What do you mean by salinity? Do you know what the salinity is? Yes, 
salinity is the amount of salt dissolved in water. When we think about fresh water, there is a low salinity. But when we think about marine water, there is a high salinity. But brackish water has a salinity, but it is less than the salinity of marine water. The amount of salt dissolved in water is simply known as the salinity. According to the salinity, we can categorize the water into three groups, fresh water, brackish water and marine water. Through that, you can identify the answer easily. Water with high salinity is known as muddy water, brackish water, fresh water and marine water. What is the answer? The answer is marine water. Which one of the following is an example for the gaseous state of water? Right? Which one of the followings is an example for the gaseous state of water? The answers given here are snow, glaciers, steam and sea water. Look at the first two answers. Snow and glaciers are in the form of solid. Steam and sea water. Steam in the form of gas and sea water is in the form of liquid. Then you can see the answer. The answer is steam because steam and water vapor are considered as the gaseous state of water. Look at the third question. This is not a type of precipitation. What do you mean by precipitation? Can you remember the word precipitation? Yes, precipitation means the ways we get water. There are different methods of getting water to the earth. That is known as precipitation. There are different methods of precipitation like rain, sleet and hail. But when we think about groundwater, that is not the method of precipitation. That is a method of water available on the earth. Then the possible answer is groundwater. That is the answer. Look at the fourth question. Which one of the followings is not a method of water pollution? Right? I would like to draw your attention towards the choices given as simple A, simple C and simple D. Releasing of household waste materials to water, that is simple A. Then simple C, addition of polythene and plastics to water bodies. Simple D, addition of agrochemicals to water bodies. My dear children, you can understand that uh, by all those methods, the water is polluted. But look at the second answer. It does not support water pollution. Using water as a medium of living for aquatic organisms. When the aquatic organisms live in water, it does not help for water pollution. It is not a reason for water pollution. So the answer is the second one. Water in lagoons is known as marine water, fresh water, brackish water and muddy water. When I started this question, I said you that the water can be divided into three types according to the salinity. According to the amount of salt dissolved in water, the water can be divided into three types. Fresh water, brackish water and marine water. Here I have given you an answer like muddy water. That means the water that is mixed up with a large amount of soil particles. When we think about the answer, the water in lagoons is known as brackish water because we can find marine water in sea and oceans. Fresh water can be found in lakes and tanks. Brackish water can be found in lagoons and the muddy water can be found in everywhere. Then the answer is C, brackish water. Let's have a look at question number 6. What is known as the energy? What do you mean by energy? Energy is the ability to do the work. Right? The ability of doing the work is known as the energy. What are the energy sources suitable to generate electricity in Sri Lanka? In our country, there are a number of energy sources used to produce the electricity. Then 
My question is, what are the energy sources suitable to generate electricity in Sri Lanka? First one is hydropower, second one wind power, third one solar power. These three methods do not help in the pollution of environment, right? Hydropower, wind power and solar power. I have given you three pictures here. Uh, hydropower, solar power and wind power. The pictures will show you that how the production of electricity is done using water. You know that the water is stored in an upper elevation, then the potential energy is stored in water, then the water is allowed to flow down fast, then the turbines are rotated with flowing water. Then uh, the electricity is produced in hydropower stations by using such a method. When we think about the production of electricity using solar power, you know solar panels can utilize the light energy of the sun to produce the electricity. So that is solar power. In third picture you can see a windmill with the help of kinetic energy of the wind the electricity is generated. Those are the methods used in our country to produce the electricity. Look at the third question. What are the fossil fuels that are used in power stations in Sri Lanka? Here are the answers. Petroleum gases, coal and petroleum oil. If you refer your textbook, you can find out the places where these fossil fuels are used to produce electricity in our country. There are certain power stations where these fossil fuels are used to produce electricity. Let us have a look at question number 4. What is biomass? Biomass, you know coconut shells, then hay, decaying fruits and vegetables are also considered as biomass. Biomass can be used to obtain energy, they can be used to obtain energy. Plants or animal materials which can be used as a fuel are known as biomass, right? Plants or animal materials which can be used as a fuel are known as biomass. Then I gave you some examples for biomass. Give three examples for renewable energy sources. When we are talking about energy sources, the energy sources can be divided into two groups renewable energy sources and non-renewable energy sources. Renewable energy sources can be used again and again, but non-renewable energy sources will be over within a very short period of time. That is the difference between renewable and non-renewable energy sources. Then give three examples for renewable energy sources, solar power, wind and sea waves. You can see that these type of uh, energy sources can be used again and again, right? So they are considered as renewable energy sources. Question number seven. If the following sentences are true, put a tick and if wrong, put a cross within the brackets, right? So you have to think about the statements. You have to check whether the statements are true, then you have to put the a tick. If the statements are wrong, you have to put the uh, cross marks. Look at the first question. The main factors which are needed for vision are a source of light and the eye. Uh, to complete the vision, there are uh, three factors to be completed. Number one is a healthy eye. Then number two is a source of light and number three, the light should come to our eye, right? But you are given two factors there, so the statement is correct. The objects which can produce their own light are called non-luminous object. The objects which can produce their own light are called as non-luminous objects. The objects or the sources of light can be divided into two groups, luminous objects and non-luminous objects. Uh, 
the objects that can produce their odd light are called as luminous objects. But the objects that can't produce their own light are called as non-luminous object. Then the statement given here is the objects which can produce their own light should be luminous objects. They are not non-luminous objects so the statement is wrong. Look at the third one. The moon is a luminous object. Is it a luminous object? No, that is not a luminous object. The moon is shining just because of the light of the sun. Right? So, that is not a luminous object, it is a non-luminous object. The statement is wrong. Look at the next one. The light is transmitted only in a straight line. Yes, you know that the light is transmitted along a straight line. So, the statement is correct. A light beam is made up of a collection of light rays. We define the light beam as a collection of light rays. When we take the sentence, that is correct. A light beam is made up of a collection of light rays, that is correct. There is a paragraph. You have to complete the paragraph with suitable words. Fill in the blanks with the given words. The objects that produce sound are called as Yes, sources of sound. Sound is produced by vibrating something. We know that the sound is produced as a result of vibrations. When a certain object is vibrated, the sound is produced. Ear is the organ which senses the sound. The ear is the organ which senses sound. Sounds that are sung or played rhythmically are known as music. Sounds that are not rhythmic are known as noise. That is the difference between music and noise. Music is rhythmic. Provide short answers. I have given you four pictures there. All the pictures are showing you magnets. There are different types of magnets. Magnets are in different shapes. First type of magnet is a horseshoe magnet and we call that horseshoe magnet. Then you can see a U magnet there, then we call that U magnet and a bar magnet and green magnet. Then you can identify the magnets easily. Horseshoe magnet, U magnet, bar magnet and green magnet. Name three instances where you can find magnets in our day to day life, right? You may have seen magnets in mortars, in pencil boxes and in some toys. I know that you have got number of answers, you can add them in your list. Question number 10, select the appropriate response for part B from part A, you have to match the answers. An instrument used to measure the electric current. You already know the answer. What is the instrument used to measure the electric current? That is ammeter. The answer is ammeter. Materials that conduct the electricity. I explained you this. The materials that conduct the electricity are known as conductors. The appliance which is used to flow electric current in one direction. You know there are electronic appliances used in electric circuits. The appliance which is used to flow electric current in one direction is diode. The unit used to measure resistance. Resistance is an important value related to electricity that is measured in ohm. Right. A good insulator. You know insulators do not uh, conduct the heat, we call them insulators. Ebonite is a good insulator, right? Those are the answers. Underline the most appropriate word to fill in the blank. Animals that consume only plant or plant materials are known as, I think this was discussed several times. Then you can easily find out the answer. Animals that consume only plants or plant materials are known as herbivores. herbivores. 
as the green plants produce food by their own, they are known as producers. They are known as producers. The process of producing food in green plants is known as photosynthesis. Easy questions you can quickly find out the answers. A linear sequence that starts from a green plant and shows the flow of energy from one living organism to other is known as a food chain. My dear children, I think you all can remember we were learning about food chains and food webs in unit 10. I explained you a lot about food chains and food webs. Then several interconnected food chains are known as a food web and a linear sequence for food is known as a food chain. Look at the last question. You are given two answers. Magby or Panda is an endangered animal. Out of the animals given here, what is the endangered animal? Panda is the endangered animal. You know, panda is living in central China, which is an endangered animal, which is in the threat of extinction. What is the difference between weather and climate? We are talking about weather and climate a lot, right? But there is a difference between weather and climate. Weather is an atmospheric condition at a specified place during short period of time. But climate is the prevailing weather condition in an area for a long time period. So we can express about weather by observing the recordings within a short time. But we have to forecast about climate by observing the conditions in the surrounding in the atmosphere for a long period of time. Climate is the prevailing weather condition in an area for a long time period. Look at the second question. What are the factors that determine weather? When we are talking about weather, we are talking about different factors. We will see the factors. Rainfall, temperature, humidity, and the speed and the direction of the wind. Now those are the factors that are considered when we talk about weather. Rainfall, temperature, humidity, the speed and the direction of the wind. Right, I have given you here some instruments. These instruments are used to measure the factors that we discussed in the earlier slide. Look at the first one. Can you identify the picture? Yes, it is a thermometer. You know the thermometers are used to measure the temperature. The thermometers are used to measure the temperature. There are different types of thermometers. They can be used to measure the temperature. Look at the second picture. That is a rain gauge. Rain gauge is used to measure the rainfall. The rainfall is measured using the rain gauge. Next one. To find out the direction of the wind, a wind vane can be used. When we describe the weather, we have to find out the direction of the wind. So the wind vane can be used. Then anemometer is used to measure the speed of the wind. The anemometer is used to measure the speed of the wind. Last one. This is a hygrometer. It is used to measure the humidity in the atmosphere. Then humidity is the amount of water vapor contained in the atmosphere that is measured by using the hygrometer. Okay, my dear children, this is the end of today's lesson. I think today's lesson was really important for you to recall what you learned in your past lessons. The surrounding where we live in is an amazing unit with thousands of mysteries. As the students who are learning science, you can investigate your environment. You can be little scientist, but you can be the scientist in future with your great ideas. At the end of our grade 6 science syllabus, I wish you the best of luck for a better future. Stay safe and goodbye.